I read that when you recorded Polly, Kurt was finger picking. Is this correct? I think it's a strum. I mean, I'm just hearing it in my head, but no, I mean, it's, it's the live guitar. And, and especially that was that whole deal that they were trying to find the pocket, you know, you know, with the, you know, the ride, the symbol ride, some eighth note pulse. And, yeah. I'm almost sure it was just a back and forth kind of folk strum or something like that. Hmm. Of, of those five songs you recorded, was there any one that gave you more of a hard time? Or was it all more or less kind of the same vibe recording all five of them? Polly was the one that he struggled with just because it had nuance and was soft. But uh, no, they, you know, they had everything did seriously in one or two takes. It was, a, you know, pretty straightforward. And I don't think any of the takes ever broke down. I just played all the way through a few times and... You know, I mean, that, 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 if anything, was the producer thing that I got to do. I got to say, oh, that, I think that's the take. That's it. And then they would listen to the playback and go, yeah, okay, that's the take. And then just do the next one. It was very, very simple. Hmm. The version on Nevermind is completely different. When you first heard that, you know, basically the acoustic version on Nevermind, what was your reaction to that? This sounds like a smart ass answer, but I thought, wow, that totally works as an acoustic song. And I thought it suited the story of the song better. Whatever you might like about the version of Polly that I recorded, I didn't do anything more than record it. So I put the sounds together, put the mics up, uh, but that's Jack's mix. You know, that's not my mix. And uh, it, it really wasn't produced at all. It's just Nirvana in her room. And that might be why you like it. Hmm. You know, Possibly, those, those, yeah. three, those three tracks that uh, didn't get finished, quote unquote, is... Nirvana is a three piece in a room in a recording studio. And you didn't hear much of that after that. Mm -hmm. Right. You yeah. know, there were, there were demos and great live recordings, but you didn't hear Nirvana in a studio where it didn't get produced after the original, you know, take was done. Yeah. No, I, I really enjoy like the rougher side of Nirvana. Like I think like that, like I like the, I actually do like the production on Nevermind. Some people don't like it because it's too produced, but I think it's great. But I like it's that. It's a record. I like, I like Nevermind. I don't listen to it, but it's really well done. Yeah. yeah. And I, I like that there is that rougher side to them. You know, they kind of went back to it with In Utero a little bit, but really it's, it's the pre-Nevermind stuff that if you want to catch them raw, that's the stuff you listen to in my, in my view, at least. I think people respond, you know, they recognize the humanity in an undoctored, you know, recording. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's where you, you know, you, that's when all that's when you, all of a sudden you've got a, a link with you know 100 years of music you know whatever we've been doing for the last 30 40 years now is it's it's a craft based thing it's not it's not about capturing live events and and that's fine that's that is what that is too steve albini talks eloquently to this time thing where there were more people in the studio than microphones hmm. You know, so, yeah. so, and so and eventually as we went forward, there were more people in the control room than there were in the studio because we were recording everything one at a time and layering up and making the 70s happen. But, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it's an awful lot of three mics in the room and it all goes down to mono or it all goes down to stereo or something like that. So I think uh, people uh, innately respond to that. They can hear that it's a bunch of people in a room or mm -hmm. three people in a room or five people in a room. Nirvana's most stripped down recordings, generally speaking, are from the pre-Nevermind era. On Nevermind itself, the most stripped down song is Polly. I want to show you guys a video that I made previously where I go into details about the history of that song. If you guys like what you see, make sure to subscribe for more. Lots more to come. When I think of dark Nirvana songs, some of the first ones that come to my mind are Floyd the Barber, Paper Cuts, Stain, a lot of the early Nirvana music was very dark thematically. And even with something like Something in the Way, it's not loud and heavy like Floyd the Barber or Paper Cuts, but Something in the Way is dark in its own right. It's dark thematically. But Polly is different because not only is it dark thematically, but it's light musically, which makes a very interesting contrast you see with something in the way it's not a very heavy song but the music itself is very somber whereas the music that's in Polly is not very somber it's essentially 
the studio version on Nevermind, at least, is essentially just Kurt Cobain playing an acoustic guitar, playing a lighthearted melody, with Chris Novoselic doing a few bass fills, and Chad Channing hitting the cymbals once in a while. Yes, that is Chad Channing on the cymbals. I'll talk about that more later on in the video. And to really accentuate that juxtaposition, there are other studio versions of Polly aside from the Nevermind version, and those studio recordings are, musically at least, very upbeat, Vite. You add the lyrics on top of it, you have really dark lyrics with a really fun melody, with a really fun instrumentation. It's a juxtaposition that is very deliberately placed together because that contrast is what makes this an iconic song, in my opinion. The studio recordings that were done aside from Nirvana, aside from Nirvana, the studio recordings that were done aside from Nevermind, those were actually with electric guitars full drums and bass. So the version on Nevermind is the only one that is basically an acoustic song. I'll talk more about those studio recordings later on in the video. My favorite version of Polly is one of those studio recordings. The one on Nevermind is still great, but for me personally, I really like one of the other studio recordings. Now, Nevermind, as we all know, was released in 1991. Polly is the sixth track on that record, but Polly was written in 1988. The thing about Polly that really sticks out is, you know, if you just listen to it without really paying attention to the lyrics, it just sounds like a, you know, a chill acoustic Nirvana song. But if you really start listening to the lyrics and what he's saying, it takes on a whole different meaning, especially if you really look into the background as to what inspired those lyrics. Originally, it was titled Hitchhiker, the name was changed to Cracker, and then the third name was Polly. The song itself, as many people know, was inspired by a tragic event that happened in 1987, but it's often overlooked that the tragic event in 87 is not the only thing which inspired Polly. There was a previous event connected to the event in 87, which also inspired Polly, and we're going to talk about that right now. In 1987, a man in his late 40s, early 50s, kidnapped a 14-year-old girl as she was leaving a rock concert in Tacoma, Washington. What happened next is absolutely horrifying. The kidnapper went on to suspend the girl upside down from the inside of his mobile home and then proceeded to rape her and torture her with a blowtorch. It is absolutely horrific. Thankfully, the young girl was able to escape, attracting the attention of people from a nearby gas station. The rapist kidnapper was later arrested and convicted for his crimes. He is currently serving two consecutive 75-year term sentences. I do not want to say his name because I do not want to give him any extra attention. As for the courageous young girl, to the best of my knowledge, her name is not publicly listed, understandably so. What happened to that 14-year-old girl in 1987 is an absolute tragedy, and what makes it even more heartbreaking is that the rapist is a repeat offender. 27 years earlier, in July of 1960, the same man picked up two hitchhikers in Sumner, Washington, which is about 15 minutes outside of Tacoma. The hitchhikers were brother and sister. The sister was only 12 years old. The rapist forced the brother out of the car at gunpoint. He then rode away with the girl and proceeded to beat her, rape her, and cut her hair. This is likely the inspiration for the line in Polly, let me take a ride, don't cut yourself. Thankfully, the 12-year-old girl eventually escaped by jumping into a river where she was discovered by a passing driver. A few days later, the rapist was in police custody and was convicted of rape and torture. He was sentenced to a minimum of 75 years in jail. However, after having served 20 years in jail, he was released on parole in 1980. If he had not been released in 1980, the 14-year-old girl in 1987 would have never been raped. The whole situation is a complete tragedy on so many levels. And this is why the relatively light-hearted music, which accompanies the dark lyrics to Polly, is so effective because it's such a contrast. Now, one of the things which makes Polly even more unsettling is that Kurt Cobain is singing from the perspective of the rapist. And the fact that he sounds bored while he's singing is an interesting way to present the song. It shows that this horrible person 
does not care in the slightest that he is causing life-altering trauma to an innocent young girl and that he's bored the whole time. And that's why, even though at first listen, Polly doesn't really sound like a dark song, when you really take into consideration all these different factors, the darkness of Polly really starts to make itself apparent. Polly was first performed live by Nirvana on June 23rd, 1989 at Rhino Records in Westwood, California. Three months later, in September of 1989, Nirvana recorded their first studio version of Polly at Music Source in Seattle with Steve Fisk, an audio engineer and producer. Nirvana recorded five songs during these sessions with Steve Fisk. The five songs were Stain, Been a Son, Even in His Youth, Polly, and Token Eastern Song. These songs were originally planned for an EP, but only two of the five songs recorded during these sessions were released on Nirvana's Blue EP in December of 89. Those two songs were Stain and Been a Son. From April 2nd to 6th, 1990, Nirvana recorded eight songs with producer Butch Vig at Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. Those songs were originally intended to be used for Nirvana's second album, which was originally going to be released by Sub Pop. Of course, that didn't happen, as Nirvana would leave Sub Pop for DGC Records. The eight songs Nirvana recorded with Butch Vig in April of 1990 were Breed, Dive, In Bloom, Stay Away, Sappy, Lithium, Here She Comes Now, and Polly. The version of Polly which appears on Nevermind is the version of Polly which was recorded with Butch Vig in April of 1990. It's the only recording from the Smart Studio Sessions which ended up on Nevermind. Nirvana's drummer at the time of the Smart Studio Sessions was Chad Channing. The acoustic guitar Kurt used for Polly was a five-string Stella guitar that Kurt says he purchased for 20 bucks from a pawn shop. In Kurt's own words, I didn't bother changing the strings. It barely stays in tune. In fact, I had to use duct tape to hold the tuning keys in place. The guitar strings were so old, they didn't have any tone to them. A real plunky sound. There are four known studio recordings of Polly. The first was recorded by Steve Fisk in Seattle in September of 89. This version of Polly was released in 2004 as part of the With the Lights Out box set. The second version was recorded on October 26, 1989 for the BBC at Maida Valley Studios in London, England by producer John Peel. The third version is the one that appears on Nevermind, and the fourth studio version of Polly was also recorded for the BBC at Maida Valley Studios in London, England by producer Midi Adhikari. This version of Polly, the one from the BBC in 1991, was released on Incesticide and is titled New Wave Polly. The version from the BBC from 1989 remains officially unreleased, though bootlegs of it are available online. This version of Polly, the 1989 BBC version, is my personal favorite version of Polly. Aside from the four studio versions of Polly, there is also a demo version which was released on the With the Lights Out box set. This demo version was recorded by Kurt Cobain at his house in Olympia back in 1988. It's just Kurt with an acoustic guitar and it's a very, very interesting rendition of the song. To date, there are six officially released live performances of Polly, including the version of Polly from Nirvana's MTV Unplugged performance. Polly was not released as a single, though it remains as an important song in Nirvana's catalog. In 2004, NME ranked Polly 18th on its list of the top 20 Nirvana songs. Rolling Stone ranked Polly 29th out of 102 Nirvana songs in 2015, and The Guardian ranked Polly 14th on their top 20 Nirvana songs list. Most notably, Bob Dylan himself is a fan of Polly. While attending a Nirvana concert, Bob Dylan was particularly impressed by Polly. Bob Dylan stated, That kid has heart. If you guys like Nirvana, make sure to subscribe to my channel. Lots more Nirvana videos to come. Thanks for watching.